Maha, thank you for welcoming us to the home of Access, Dearborn, Michigan. <laughs> Maha, under your leadership, a storefront community organization has scaled to become a multi-million dollar institution serving over 70,000 beneficiaries each year. What an impact statement, mashallah. Those of you who know Maha, anybody know who's Maha here? She has the uncanny ability and charisma and persuasiveness to convince you to do anything that you did not intend on doing. <laughs> and you end up supporting things you never thought you'd walk into support. Maha, your sincerity of purpose, courage, and unrelenting pursuit makes the impossible possible. When you think of a community builder, you think of someone who loves the community, who's deeply invested and rooted, who critiques yet builds, who nurtures and seeds the future. Maha, thank you for being a mentor and a trailblazer to all of us. And congratulations on being named the 2022 Community Builder Award recipient. <laughs>
Meta sees access as a means to contributing to the greater good, to make our society a more compassionate place, and to unlock the power of Arab American philanthropy toward this goal. What makes Meha such a hero of mine, though, is her marriage of the practical with the principled, the passion with the sustainable plan. It's not well-intentioned do-gooding. It's the application of the very best in skills and knowledge from the corporate sector applied to the most in need. What organizations that serve Arab and Muslim communities need is not more passion. We have so much passion, mashallah. What we need is more brick by brick, painstaking, crafted strategy to sustainable growth. We can all learn a great deal from Meha's example. After speaking with Meha, I was left truly inspired and hopeful about the future of our community's potential as change agents. It made me redouble my own commitment to patient, passionate, and purposeful work, however behind the scenes. Thank you, Dahlia. It is truly the honor of a lifetime and one that I, um, I already know I, I couldn't possibly do justice. But I'm gonna try to introduce Maha tonight and have her accept her award. I can think of few people for whom both the words community and the word builder come together as beautifully as those two words come together for Maha. Like Maha, I too had to consciously work to build community. In my case, as the executive director of the Sikh Coalition, a Sikh civil rights organization that arose in the aftermath of 9-11. The weeks and the months after 9-11 were filled with risk for anyone who looked like me and dared to even just walk outside. I could not walk down the street or go to the mall or go to the airport or take a train to work without stairs, without people moving away from me, and too often without harassment. Meha, I want you to know that during those dark times, in the first year of the Sikh Coalition's existence, we had a board meeting and we were looking for models and we openly discussed access and your work as a model for, long, for a long-standing community organization with roots in its community that was deeply relevant to the daily lives of its community and was continually working to build critical infrastructure for its community. You might not know it back then, Maha, but in a dark time, you and Access were showing me and fellow six some light. Thank you for showing me and showing all of us the way to build community. Maha, when I look at you and what you've built and the lessons to be learned from your work, those lessons are as important as ever. You are not. I'm afraid to break it. You are not a TikTok activist. I don't know if you're on a platform now owned by Elon Musk, but if you are on that platform, I'm not aware of that. When you speak, you are effective, but I've observed you feel no need 
to occupy all the air in the room. And guess what? I'll say it. You, in fact, are more effective and accomplished than those who may be more loud, and it's, in, and it's a lesson and a learning that needs to be absorbed. And why? Why does that lesson that you've given us about humble, steady, consistent, effective leadership need to be absorbed now? Here's why. Today, we're loudly and accurately hearing that our rights and our very democracy are under attack, and we must act now to save ourselves. And in those accurate and urgent calls for action, there are often brave activists running from fire to fire, rightly so. And guess what? When you're a firefighter, there's glory to it. But I must say, the lesson that we must all learn from you and access is that while, yes, we must act now, uh, we must also, with quiet, humble, consistent determination, also build for the future so that we have the infrastructure. It's not always glamorous, but the infrastructure we need to change the long-term structural conditions that are holding back our communities. Whether it's yours and Access's work to create and seed the beautiful national gift that is the Arab American National Museum, or to create and seed the Center for Amer a a Arab American Philanthropy, or yours and Access's work to create and seed the national network of Arab American communities, your work and that of Access is teaching us that yes, Act now, but just as intensely, just as humbly, do the slow, less glamorous work of building for the future. Thank you for that uh, relevant as ever lesson, Maha. I'll close by sharing that I interviewed you, as you might remember, when I was a senior program officer at the Open Society uh, Foundations and Access was transitioning from Hassan's amazing leadership to yours. I wrote in an internal memo to my colleagues back then that they should not worry about Access's future or whether to continue to support Access. I wrote, quote, Maha is a stable, calm, informed leader and, and, and Access is in the very best of hands. She is exactly what Access needs because her vision and that of Access is larger than the next five years and she is right there with it. Long-term building is in her DNA. Meha, thank you for building community. Thank you for building institutions that will outlive yours and our lifetimes. I can think of few more deserving of an award entitled Community Builder. You embody both words and their union so deeply. Meha, I'm honored along with Kareem El Hibri, Dalia Mogahed, and Farhan Latif to present you with the 2022 Community Builder Award. Please come up. <laughs> evening. Um, I was going to start a little bit differently, um, uh, but, um, you know, my heart is uh, absolutely full with gratitude. And uh, a wise person told me one time that the value, uh, you know, we always recognize the value of generosity and we say thank you to people when, uh, when uh, and recognize them when they give, but it's as important to acknowledge the value of gratitude and um, my heart is filled with gratitude. Thank you.
And I truly appreciate uh, the kind introduction by um, Amar and Dahlia, but uh, you know, I want to set something straight. Uh, I really cannot. <laughs> it, it sounded like like it's a one person, you know, taking credit for everything. But we all know that it takes a village really to accomplish anything. And access was built on the shoulders of giants. Uh, many of them are here in the room. And it is still built uh, on the shoulders of the amazing access team that works every day towards a very, very, very powerful and strong purpose. So I cannot take a credit for, I appreciate you know, how you described me, but it cannot be a one person's job. It's impossible. So, so I uh, am very, very humbled, of course, to receive this honor. And it's extra special, actually, because it is from El Hebri Foundation, which I consider a family. Um, you know, I look around the room and I see so many faces and people who share the access values of building communities. You know, one person, one family, one community at a time. So thank you for El Hebri board, staff, and community both from Michigan from, and from all over the country that you honored us with your presence with us tonight. Thank you for everything you stand for. Thank you. Uh, of course, thank you to my Axis family. You know, you are the change agents towards a just and equi an equitable uh, world. And you inspire me with your actions every day. So thank you for that. And thank you to my family. My husband, Roy, who is my rock. He is my best friend. And a secret for, you know, people who are married less than seven years, 33 years of marriage, and he still makes me laugh till today. That's a huge accomplishment. And of course, the light of my life, my sons, Laith and Omar. Laith couldn't be here today, but Omar is here. Uh, you know, I thank God every day for the blessing that he gave me to watch you both uh, carve your place in the world with integrity, humility, and purpose. Thank God. I'm so thankful for that, Habibi Omar. And your brother, Lay. <laughs> Not only Omar. <laughs> and of course, um, thanks to my extended family, especially my father, God bless his soul, and two strong women in my life, my grandmother, Siti Maryam, and my mom. Uh, and since we are really, um, you know, a product of the ecosystem that surrounds us, I'm going to be sharing with you a story that involves my mom. But I want to give you a little bit of background first. So I grew up in a village called Umm al Fahim, which is located in uh, historic Palestine. Uh, where Israel was established in 1948. And, um, you know, I, uh, I was very aware from a very young age, I remember those days very, very well, about many inequities that uh, surrounded me. You know, I was a female in a male-dominated society. I was a Palestinian Muslim in a Jewish state. And my family had very, very limited economic means. We didn't have much. And I spent a lot of days and nights thinking about the hand that was dealt to me and to many people around me. Um, 
And I think that's truly where my commitment to justice and equity started and drove my actions for the rest of my, for the rest of my life. Um, so, uh, I, um, I want to tell you something about my mother. She, she was a seamstress, and she worked many, many hours every day, and she was actually the, the main breadwinner in our family. So we as kids used to watch our dad and the rest of the men in the village read before dawn to have manual labor in nearby Jewish cities and come back after dark just to sleep. We didn't see them, they just came home to sleep. And my mother, it seems like it was every day to me right now, she reminded me and my siblings on a daily basis, it seems to me, that the only way out for us is through education. And I took it literally, I like, focused so much on school. I like my whole identity was about me being a good student. So when it came time for me attending high school, my teachers thought that, you know, the, the public school, the public high school in the village, uh, which, you know, Arab schools, Arab public schools are heavily underfunded uh, by the Israeli government compared to the Jewish public schools. So they thought that the public school in the village didn't have what it takes to support a student like me. And overachieving students uh, from my village, they, they attended private uh, Christian schools in um, Nazareth or in Haifa. And since we didn't have the means, a good solution was for me to enroll in the well-funded high school in a town called Afula, just north of Umm al -Fahim. So I applied and a few months passed and I didn't get any response, good or bad, and I started to be super anxious. So my mom, one day, leaves in the morning to another Jewish towns, this one is south of Umm al-Fahim, it's called Khedera, to check on a medical test for one of my siblings. And, you know, she spent a whole day full of bureaucracy and bus transfers, and in her way back, uh, when she reached the bus stop in front of my village, my mom, my mom decided not to get that. She continued north to Afula because she wanted to check on my application. I have no idea, you know, with limited knowledge of the Hebrew language and the way she looked with her dress. I mean, it's not the friendliest uh, kind of town, Afula, to Arabs. She asked around, find, found a school about a mile away from the central bus station and asked about my application and actually found out that I was accepted and that they just couldn't deliver the letter because we didn't have any proper street addresses in my village. So she comes home with very late, I have to say, because we didn't know where she went, uh, with that acceptance letter in her hand and I will never ever forget that day. It's, it's, it's a simple yet intentional action that had a ripple effect not only on my life but on everybody around me. It, it really changed my life and most likely it is the reason I'm standing before you here today. So when we think about what philanthropy is all about and community building is all about, it's really simple. It's, you know, acts of kindness, uh, kindness that, are, that can be big or small have the ability and may have the possibility of having a ripple effect 
that transforms lives. It's as simple as that. The gist of the work that we do at Access is that we provide the ecosystem that unites Arab Americans from all walks of life and, and inspires each one of us individually and collectively to improve communities through our giving of our time, our treasure, and our talent. Um, our mantra at Access is that we are in the business of building communities. That's what we say, we tell each other. We are in the business of building communities. And working in that space requires a great deal of resilience, humility, focus, and endless, endless, endless hope. It's really, it's really something that requires all of the above. Otherwise, there is no way we can succeed. And what we aim to do through our organization, again, is to unite and empower Arab Americans. Um, and, you know, that come from, uh, here is the, 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 the hardship in doing this, that come from different backgrounds and they share an identity, but they vary in uh, religion and uh, background of uh, which country they came from. And I believe that El Hibri Foundation is involved in similar work as it aims to unite and empower a community that shares a faith, but varies when it comes to backgrounds of race, ethnicity, and sects of Islam. So I learned a couple of lessons through this journey. One, that it is really much more impactful if you stand for something than being against its opposite. And two, is that it's way more powerful if you are proactive about what you stand for rather than reacting emotionally about what you are against. Um, you know, institution building is not really glamorous at all. It requires a tenacity to work day in and day out on the building blocks towards this vision that you see so clearly, but it's far and it's hard to reach. Um, you know, focusing your energies on creating that ecosystem uh, with positive purpose, uh, drowning out all the doubts and negativity, and yes, sometimes a lot of noise that may surround you, and creating and nurturing and attracting the culture and building the culture of competence um, and optimism that is so necessary to succeed and reach your goals. I think if you wanna you know, sum this in one sentence, the brilliant, my favorite poet Rumi, um, really said it best in my opinion. He wrote, um, it is rain that grows flowers, not thunder. So I wanna thank you. I wanna thank every single one of you for being that rain that grows and builds our gardens and our communities. Thank you so much. <laughs>